Let's start with a little journey. When I was 11 years old, my mother took me to a Michael Jackson concert. We had seats very far in the back and I could hardly see anything, but it was an incredible experience. A few days later, that same concert was broadcast on TV and I recorded it on a VHS cassette. Remember those? And I would watch it hundreds and hundreds of times, alone and with my friends. I would spend hours building myself the costumes. I would cut open white socks, glue them onto black uh, shoes for a smooth criminal. I would wear a white shirt, uh, leave it open for a man in the mirror. I was, I was Michael Jackson in those moments. And together with my friends, we would watch the performance and we would rehearse the choreographies and we would play them for our friends in school. And I learned in that moment that you can build stuff and you can become a version of yourself that is exciting to yourself and to others. And you can be inspired by art and you can be on the stage and people can watch you and it can be a beautiful feeling. Many years later, I was in a training course on intercultural learning. And I was in this exercise with some other people from all over the place. And our task in this exercise was to rate the morality of a character in a story. And this one participant and me, we could just not agree on who was behaving in the most moral way. The person in the story who I thought behaved in the most moral way, the other person thought behaved the least morally. And we were just arguing and arguing, and we had to finish the exercise agreeing to disagree. And I learned in that moment that what I may take as objective truths about the world are actually highly subjective, and that it makes sense to be curious about other people's ideas, about other people's worldviews, and that the way how we construct reality is an active process that happens within us. A few years after that, I visited Auschwitz with the woman who I am now married to. And I saw there all the horrors that were inflicted, organized, planned, indicated, signed in my mother tongue, in German. And I can still see the piles of glasses and the mountains of, of luggage and, and it still is very difficult for me to sing back to it. And I learned in that moment really what it means to me to be German. Before that, I would not have considered that to be an important category to describe me or to be meaningful for me. But in that moment, I really realized, no, this is part of who I am. This is part of me. And I carry with me the responsibility that comes with that legacy. And I, I have it. I have it still with me. Three stories about learning. Three stories about transformation. And they are my stories. They are meaningful to me. I carry them with me. They are in my mind. And I have hundreds of stories like that, just as everybody else in the audience. The stories that you have in your head, those are your stories. Those are the stories about your learning, about your transformation, about your growth. And it's not so important right now what those stories are about, but what I would like to spend a moment on is to consider the shape of these memories, because we carry the meaning of our past in the shape of stories. And that for me was a profound idea, and it, it changed the way how I work. Because the experiencing self is always in the now, right? The one who we are right now, the experiencing self, is right here, right now, as Daniel Kahneman said. It takes in the experiences of the world through our sensory organs and then transforms it into neural activity and that's it. But our remembering self takes out of those experiences and categorizes them into meaning. And our remembering self our remembering self is a storyteller. So if we want to take that thought seriously, we can think about, okay, if our remembering self is a storyteller 
And if we make sense of our life through those stories that we tell about ourselves, then we can spend some time thinking about the shape of the story. And people much smarter than me have thought about that already, and they came up with a few ideas. Joseph Campbell thought about this idea of the fundamental architecture of a story, and he called it the hero's journey. Maybe some of you have heard of it. And many years after him, a screenwriter called Dan Harmon turned that idea and made it a little bit more simple and called it a story circle with only eight steps instead of 17, right? But it's the same idea, is that there is a protagonist, the protagonist has a need, goes into the unknown, has some kind of challenge, has some search, finds an insight, finds a new perspective, takes it, and returns into the known world. And if you think about it, that's every story you've ever heard, probably. It's every action movie, it's every romantic comedy, it's, it's Harry Potter, it's Lord of the Rings, it's the Marvel Universe, it's a joke, and it's the Bible, right? It's, it's the architecture that almost every story has that we, uh, that we know of, that, that stays with us very easily. So we can combine those two ideas. We can take the fact that we experience our life in story form and that we remember important learning events in story form and this idea of the fundamental architecture or this principal architecture of the story circle. And I would like to go through three potential scenarios with you where you can use the story circle, where you can use this hero's journey. You might call it in that sentence, in that sense, a learner's journey. We can use that to facilitate someone's learning process. I would like to think about this as a parent, with yourself, and as a leader or a manager. So as a parent, let's say you have a, a kid. Well, if you're a parent, you're gonna have a kid. That's kind of in the definition of it. But let's say that kid is about to go into puberty, right? Is about to go on this adventure into this struggle, into this uh, exciting phase of their life. And the protagonist focus, it can really help us as parents to remember that our task as a parent is not to help our kid become who we want it to become, but to help it become and continuously be who they are, who they are becoming. And that focus can really change something, that paradigm shift can really change something. And then all the big things that happen in their life, from a, a fight with their friends, a conflict with a teacher, uh, falling in love, having stupid, boring parents, their hobbies not working out, etc., etc. All of this we can understand as, as a call to adventure, as a need to go into the unknown. Something is pulling them into the unknown or pushing them into the unknown. And we can help them go there. And it takes two really important things that allow someone to go into the unknown in a way that they can make the best of it. It needs challenge and it needs safety. The safety can come from us just unconditionally accepting and loving them as who they are and them knowing that we're always there for them and always having their back. And the challenge can come from us actually being firm on some norms or values that we hold really dear that we hold them accountable to what also they say is important to them, that we take them seriously even if it's hard. And as they go through this challenging time with the conflict or the love or the hobby, we can just create those calm moments of togetherness where we can reflect on what's happening, where we can explore what the struggle is, where we can create little pockets of pause, where they can uh, reflect and, and make sense and maybe find those things that are there to be found for them. Because then, when we give them this chance to, to find the meaning in the challenge, and we can work with them to make it theirs, then they can emerge from this with a sense of who they are, with a sense of accomplishment, with a sense of self-worth, with a sense of knowing that they can meet challenges, and they are ready to meet the next challenge that is ready for them. If we use this approach to think about 
how we can help ourselves learn. Because maybe you're not a parent, maybe you're not a leader, maybe you're just here with yourself looking at the person in the mirror. Then you can use this as well. I don't know about you, but I'm living right now in, uh, in February two th uh, 2021, and we've just gone through a year of a pandemic, a global pandemic. And that was quite a challenging time. It still is, right? And the protagonist focus for me in this moment can really help to be clear on who I am, what is important for me, and my position in this world and in this life, and just reflect on what I am actually feeling right now. The need phase, yes, that was thrust upon us. We didn't choose to go into lockdown. We didn't choose to spice our life up with a little pandemic, right? This just happened to us. Suddenly our work was different. Suddenly life was different. Suddenly the freedoms that we had were different. Suddenly we had to do things we had never had to do before. And so we had to go into this unknown. And what made it easier for me was to actually select a few challenges in there that I can choose. So like hundreds and thousands of people, I started to bake sourdough bread, right? And, and I explored with it and I, I made it my challenge. I read the blog posts, I watched the YouTube videos, I did everything and I made some beautiful breads. And I also did some home improvement projects, etc. I also asked and sought out the help of my friends and my family and my partner to know that I am okay, to know that in moments of vulnerability and, and when I'm struggling with this, that I can talk to someone and someone can be there and have my back. And I would love to tell you how this is going to go on from here, how I am going to emerge from this, how we are all going to emerge from this, but we are just still in this moment. And right now, my task is for me is to find the little nuggets of insight, the little nuggets of paradigm shifting understandings that I want to take with me. It won't be sourdough bread baking because maintaining a, a starter is just too much of a hassle for me. And those things are hungry. They eat a lot of flour and I, I'd rather do something else with that flour, to be honest. But I hope it will be these focus on the small joys in life. I hope it will be the sense of responsibility for my friends and my family and my community and my neighbors that we have all somehow amplified and developed in this time. But I'm still in the lookout here. I'm still looking for what is it that I want to take with me from here so that this wasn't just an annoying year, but that it actually was also a catalyzer for growth and development and learning for myself. We can use this as well as a leader or as a manager. Let's say you lead a team of a couple of people in an organization. And your task as a leader is, yes, to supervise the work of the people that you lead and to take decisions and so on. But your task is also to support and accompany the growth of the people that you lead. I would actually go as far to say that is what leadership is. Leadership is growth companionship. And if you take that perspective, then it means that your task with every single person that you lead is not just to tell them what to do, but to focus on who they are and what journey they are on and where it is that they want to go and how you can make the things that you ask them to do be an integral part of that journey. And then it completely transforms your one-on-ones from just how I use to truly looking at the things that have happened and how they fit into someone's journey and how you can challenge them to take the next steps, how you can challenge them to fail interestingly, how you can challenge them to, to take that extra mile because you know they will, will feel safe because you see them and you see where it is that they want to go. You can even take a step back and look at your entire team as an ensemble of heroes that are on a journey together. You know, like the Avengers or the A-Team or friends, right? And you can see how their journey together is actually uh, going into the same direction, how the different tasks, the different ambitions, the different skills and competencies of all the people together 
are amplifying each other as they go on this journey together. And then you create a community that goes somewhere instead of just a group of people that does something. Right? So three different scenarios. It can apply for so many other scenarios as well because everybody is a learning companion. You don't have to be a teacher, a trainer, a coach or a mentor. Even as a friend, as a parent, as a leader, as just the person you see in the mirror every day, you are a companion on someone else's learning journey. And just as the heroes in the stories that we love, Gandalf for Frodo, Professor Dumbledore for Harry Potter, M for James Bond, Princess Leia for Rey, they are, it, the story is not about them, but they are there to take the protagonist to where they need to go, to be there for them, and to facilitate their process. And I would encourage everyone to, to be like that, to take advantage of this opportunity to be a companion on someone else's learning journey. Thank you.